all you do is substitute the blog number to have a user-friendly link to get you right there. 12 lead ECG interpretation with a focus also of how to recognize acute infarction, particularly should you be activating the cath lab, this is acute coronary occlusion. But along the way, we will be emphasizing a systematic approach to ECG interpretation. So let's get started. The ECG in the figure was obtained from a previously healthy older man who contacted emergency medical services because of chest tightness that began one hour earlier. So given this history, how would you interpret the ECG? Should you activate the catheterization lab? And the question is, what would you do with this? So yes, this patient's having a STEMI, that's ST elevation myocardial infarction. No, this patient's not having a STEMI, so no, I would not activate the cath lab. Yes, assume OMI until proven otherwise. How many of you, I'd love to know, have heard of the term OMI, occlusion-based myocardial infarction, prior to this talk? A couple of definitions. ST elevation myocardial infarction. It's a millimeter-based definition. ST elevation at the J point in two contiguous leads right next to each other with the cutoff point being at least a millimeter in all leads except for leads V2 and V3. And the rationale for this is leads V2 and V3 often normally have a slight amount of ST segment elevation. So they need more. And the criteria, this gets kind of complicated, doesn't it? If you're older than 40 years of age, then two millimeters is enough in leads V2 and V3. If you're younger than 40 years of age and you're a man, you need two and a half millimeters. If a woman, you need one and a half millimeters. And I will tell you, I don't remember these criteria and I don't feel bad about not remembering them because I find they are not useful. It's based on the STEMI paradigm, which is an old and I believe fully outdated paradigm in 2023. But it's a paradigm that's still used. I still see loads of people, including loads of cardiologists worldwide that are stuck in the STEMI paradigm. So I wanna go over what's called the OMI manifesto. So OMI is an abbreviation it simply means an occlusion-based myocardial infarction. It's based on the principle that with an acute MI, most of the time, probably 90% or more of cases, there is acute occlusion, blockage of a major coronary vessel, and that's what causes the infarct. If you're using millimeter-based criteria, STEMI criteria that I went over a moment ago, you're going to miss at least, at least 25 to 30% of acute coronary occlusions. And if we think about what we're doing in acute MI, what do you want to know? What's the emergency? So you want to know if there's an acute coronary occlusion because those are the patients who can benefit from opening up the acutely occluded vessel whether you do this by thrombolytic therapy, depending upon what type of institution you have, what modalities are available, or ideally, if you have access to cath lab that can be activated at any point in time. One of the key concepts regarding OMI is to appreciate what happens with most infarctions. There's acute coronary occlusion, an OMI. The vessel closes. So what we want to do is reperfusion. One of the things many people still do not appreciate is that spontaneous, without any treatment at all, spontaneous reperfusion can occur. When the vessel acutely occludes, the patient often gets symptoms, usually chest pain. What do you think happens if the vessel spontaneously opens? Most of the time, the chest pain will go away. If the ST segments went up when the vessel was occluded, if the vessel opens, the chest pain will go away, the ST elevation will become less, 
it may go away. And as the vessel continues to reperfuse, you may get reperfusion ST T waves, usually in the form of T wave inversion. So that's the thought behind an OMI. You can recognize an OMI. And this is the point that unfortunately all too many clinicians still don't recognize is the fact that they're still waiting for STEMI. If you don't have a STEMI by those millimeter based criteria, they say, we don't go to the cath lab. And that misses a window because by the time those patients get a STEMI, they're in trouble. Now, what happens if you had ST elevation? It lasted for maybe 30 minutes, an hour. It goes away because there was spontaneous reperfusion, but the process may not be over because what spontaneously opened might just as easily spontaneously reclose. So if you have evidence that there was an OMI, even if there's spontaneous reperfusion, the ST segment elevation is gone, the patient feels better, that patient still needs reperfusion therapy, ideally going to the cath lab to prevent spontaneous reclosure of the culprit vessel. These are a few things. I won't have time to go into all of these today. Hyperacute T waves. This is something you can recognize. Old computer algorithms do not recognize this. Newer computer algorithms by AI can potentially, depending on the algorithm, recognize it. But all of you can learn to recognize it if you're not familiar with it. The T wave looks funny. It may have taller than expected peak, maybe fatter at its peak, wider at its base. You can recognize this. This is based in proportion to the size of the R wave and the lead. There is a magical relationship between lead three and opposite lying lead AVL. When you have an acute inferior infarction, the inferior leads of ST elevation. And most of the time, you'll see reciprocal, oppositely directed ST depression in AVL that tells you you have an OMI. ST depression that's maximal and leads V2 to V4. This oftentimes suggests an acute posterior OMI. And the last thing here is dynamic ST T wave changes. It simply means that you started out with ST segments that were depressed or were elevated. The patient's chest pain either increases or decreases. You repeat the ECG, there's been a change. This is dynamic. It shows you the process is in flux. There was spontaneous reperfusion or spontaneous reocclusion. And if you see this, take the patient to the cath lab. Let's get back to this tracing because one of my key goals for this series is to go over the systematic approach to 12 lead ECG interpretation. Those of you who attended my series on arrhythmias recall that I talked about watch your P's and Q's and the three R's for my systematic approach to rhythm. Those are the five parameters to look for P waves, QRS width regularity of the rhythm, rate of the rhythm, and if they're P waves, if they're related to the QRS complex. With 12 lead ECGs, we have another system. Systematic interpretation does not, does not slow you down. On the contrary, it speeds you up. This is the most common thing that's overlooked, not having a system. So what is my system for 12 lead? So I want to look at rate and rhythm. This is the same thing that we did with my first series, watch your P's and Q's and the three R's. I next want to look at intervals. There are three intervals, the PR interval, the QRS, and the QT. The PR interval is long if it's larger than a large box. The QRS is wide if it's greater than half a large box, greater than 0.10. And the QTC, their formulas for this, but in general should not be more than half the RTAR interval. Axis, I won't get into details today. Then we're going to have chamber enlargement, which we won't go into today. And then we have QRST changes. 
regardless of the system you use, whether you use my system or another system. If the QRS is why, before you go further, find out why. Why is the QRS why? Is it due to a bundle branch block or some type of conduction defect? And the reason for this is to save you time. Because if you have a bundle branch block, if you have WPW, other conduction defect, then all of the criteria you're going to use for axes, for chamber enlargement, and particularly for assessing for ischemia infarction will be different. So if the QRS is wide, find out why it is wide before going further. Today, we want to talk about looking for QRST changes. I look at all of the leads looking for the presence of Q waves. I look for R wave progression. And then I look for ST segment and T wave changes. ECG interpretation has two steps. Step number one is the easy part. I just describe what I see rate rhythm intervals, axis, hypertrophy, QRST changes. Step two is the clinical impression. That's where we figure out, based on the history, what to do with the patient. So let's go back and apply this. Rate and rhythm, that I can look at the two, see an upright P wave, constant PR interval. The rate is about four large boxes, 75. So this is a regular sinus rhythm. The rate is about 75. Great rhythm intervals, the PR interval is not more than a large box. The QRS is not more than half a large box. And I can look at all 12 leads for this because sometimes part of the QRS may lie in the baseline. But the QRS is narrow. It's a supraventricular sinus rhythm, no conduction defect. The QTC, I'm going to look at the lead where I can probably see it the longest. It does not look to be significantly greater than half the RTAR interval. It's probably fine. Rate rhythm intervals, axis, I'm upright in lead one. I'm more upright in lead AVF, so it's probably plus 60, plus 70 degrees or so. A normal axis. Chamber enlargement, again, that's not the purpose of today. I'll just mention the number 35 as the most helpful number criteria. Deepest S wave in lead V1 view. Smallest R wave V5, V6. It's not more than 35. No chamber enlargement. We are up to QRST changes. Are there any Q waves? Now, lead AVR doesn't really count for Q waves because AVR is from the upper right quadrant. It's looking away from the heart. But is there a Q wave in any other lead? What do you think? And how many of you recognize this really pretty big, pretty wide Q wave? It's especially large given the small size of the R wave. So that's a Q wave. And looking at all the other leads, it's the only Q wave I see. R wave progression. The R wave should get progressively taller and somewhere between V2 to V4. The R wave should get taller than the S wave, which it does here between lead V3 to V4. That's normal. So there's normal progression. What about ST segments and T waves? The more experienced you get with this, the more you're going to look at groups of leads. There is ST depression in each of the inferior leads with an upright, pretty large upright terminal T wave. And I have ST depression that pretty much begins in lead V3, V4, V5, V6. In which lead or leads is the ST depression greatest? And perhaps you notice it's greatest in V3, V4. And perhaps you appreciated these T waves are really pretty tall in these leads. I will draw your attention to the fact that the ST segment is isoelectric, not elevated, not depressed in lead V2. Remember what I said about leads V2, V3, that normally there is slight ST elevation. This is not normal. This is flat for the ST segment, and it should normally be a little bit elevated. If you look at this little schematic, these are 
chest leads, anterior leads, V1, V2, V3, and then we get to lateral chest leads. There is no good lead that looks at the posterior wall of the left ventricle. So a lot of people say, well, let's look at posterior leads, V7, V8. But the problem is, look at all of this muscle mass and lung space that you've got to get through to get to posterior leads. So it is much easier if you look at the mirror image of these anterior leads. And that gives you a mirror image view of what's going on in the posterior leads. And it just takes a little bit of practice to get used to this. So here is the actual schematic tracing. And if I flip it up, that's all I've done is flip it up here. Doesn't this look like what you expect with an infarct? The taller the R wave normally, the deeper the Q. And the deeper the ST segment depression, the more it looks like an acute infarct. That's a mirror test. And with a little bit of practice, you can get used to looking at this. And this was one of the criteria that I mentioned when you're looking for how do you recognize an OMI. There's no ST elevation on this particular tracing, but there is maximal ST depression in V3, V4. These funny looking terminally positive T waves. And if you do a mirror test, doesn't that look like an infarct? Another concept is when you have such diffuse ST depression. You look at this in three of the limb leads. You have them in V3, V4, V5, V6. And you have a little ST elevation in AVR. This is something called diffuse subendocardial ischemia. And it can be due to a lot of things. It is not. It is not only left main disease. It could be any type of severe coronary disease. Or it could even be something that's non-cardiac. Patients with anemia. You got a hemoglobin of, let's say, 6 and a hematocrit of 18. That can give you diffuse ischemia, or a tachycardia can do this, or severe coronary disease. So, this patient's got a lot of ST segment depression, but the most ST depression, V3, V4, with the positive mirror test, and the patient's having chest pain. So, this is a patient that you want to consider strongly as having an OMI. I'm going to show you this follow-up tracing. This was done 18 minutes later. You could see the nine regular leads and three leads, V4, R, V8, V9. So they did not, they did not repeat a regular 12-lead ECG. Instead, they got rid of leads V4, V5, V6, and they replaced them with V4, R, V8, V9. And my message to you is if you're going to do other leads, do a repeat complete 12 lead and do the other leads. Because here we lose what's happening in V4, V5, V6. Now, this is 18 minutes later. The patient's chest pain is now less. Before we look at these other leads, you tell me what's going on. What do you think? Compare this, and I will emphasize this is the best way to compare ECGs. A lot of people, they look at one, then they look at the other. you got to look them side by side, because otherwise it's very easy to overlook differences. And if I look side by side, is there any doubt that the ST segment depression is less compared to the earlier leads? that the T waves, particularly in the chest leads, were greater initially, and they're less here, and there is now significantly less ST depression here, and the patient's chest pain is less. What do you think? What is that? There is a change, as well as documentation of change in the patient's symptoms. So these are dynamic ST-T wave changes this is data. I don't even care what the troponin is. I don't care about anything else. This tells me this is an OMI with the good news that 18 minutes later, there probably was some spontaneous reperfusion. And this patient needs to have some definitive reperfusion. Ideally, go to the cath lab so you can do PCI to prevent the vessel from reoccluding.
V4R, it's the best right-sided lead to tell you if we have a right-sided infarction, because oftentimes it's hard to tell that, and there's no right-sided ST elevation, so no. Now, V8 and V9, they do show some slight ST elevation, but I maintain that the amount of ST depression that you saw in V3, V4, and the amount of abnormality of these tremendously tall hyperacute T waves is much greater than the tiny amount you have here after passing through all the back thick musculature. But the point here, this is a serial tracing, and I will tell you the overwhelming majority, they never write down what happens to the patient's chest pain. At the time, each ECG is done, and they lose all of this data. Here's the follow-up of today's case. There was really good care by the emergency medical team. They quickly recognized there was an OMI, an OMI. The on-call cardiologist did do emergency cath. This patient had multivessel disease with an acute blockage occlusion, an acute OMI, the first obtuse marginal branch. This is a branch of the left circumflex artery. So we diagnosed this basically. We said there was an OMI, there was a posterior infarction, patient has multivessel disease. That's what all of this acute ST depression was. And this was good care by the on-care team.